I play the harmonica for a living. I've been playing concerti for well over 40, 45 years now. Um, I've always felt that my job, the great, the pioneers of the classical harmonica were uh, Larry Adler and John Sebastian, um, Chamber Wong, Tommy Riley. My job was to pick up where Adler and Sebastian left off and go to the next level. Um, I know that it's hard to imagine, but when you play in an orchestra with musicians that are in that orchestra, every single one of those musicians has had a teacher. And every single one of their teachers has had a teacher. And every single one of their teacher's teacher has had a teacher. If you're talking about, let's say, if my wife plays flute, it probably goes back to Quantz and Bach, where they're teachers of the teacher of the teacher, you know, just on and on. So they have this tradition of education that we in the harmonica society have... Um, not quite figured out yet. And the purpose of having a teacher is not to teach you how to play the harmonica. The purpose is to teach you how to teach yourself to play the harmonica. When I say that, my job is to make your job a lot easier. Because I'll know if you use this technique, you can play it for three or four or five years and you'll never be able to master it because I've already gone down that road and spent that time. But if you use this technique, you'll actually be able to use it and in a couple of years, it will become a viable part. Uh, a lot of you play diatonic harmonica and I would like to introduce you to a new axe which is the chromatic harmonica if you haven't been playing it. The similarities are amazing. First of all, if you play diatonic harmonica, I'm assuming, maybe, but you already can play a single note. You already know how to blow and draw. If you look at a specific scale from whole five, six, seven, and eight, this is exact same scale as on the chromatic harmonica. So I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see this. Can you see the layout? Not yet, probably. Uh, I have to go to share screen, go to basic, and this is the harmonica layout. You've lost your sound there, Robert. You need to unmute yourself. We've lost your sound, Robert. We can't hear you. Pete, Robert can't hear you. You've got a wave, remember? Can't hear you. We put it in the chat. He's going to give me feedback. Can we unmute him? Are you hearing me now? Oh, yes. Yes, we're hearing you now. Same we quality as before. Yes, we uh, okay. we lost you. For, we lost you for about a minute there, Robert. Okay, sorry. I'm sharing my screen, right? Right. You are indeed. Um. So, the four holes are C and D in the first hole, E and F in the second hole, G and A in the third hole, and B and C in the fourth hole. These four holes. There is no way in your lifetime that you can know this pattern well enough. I say that because when you get into complicated patterns, knowing where you are is so difficult because the patterns make it tricky. So again, hole one is CD, hole two is EF, hole three is GA, and hole four is BC. Some people have asked why is it go blow, draw, blow, draw, blow, draw, draw, blow. 
Well, the reason, of course, is that when they first designed harmonicas, they wanted them to play oom-pa-pa music. You needed the C chord on the blow. So you needed to be able to play a chord, and then they early harmonicas had like a G7. We have a B half diminished on the draw. If you push the button in, you get D flat, E flat, F, G flat, A flat, B flat, and C, D flat. Um, if now go to what would be the beginning of scales. is helping me out here. Sorry, guys. Zoom is being automatic, and I don't want it. Uh, okay. So, this is the C scale pattern. Is that being shown? No. Okay, so Zoom turn that off automatically. Basic. Okay, so you're now seeing two octaves of the same pattern C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And these two octaves are that box, the four holes, repeated all the way up the chromatic harmonic. So that's all there is. Nothing is changed on the, from the first four holes, the next four holes, the next four holes are all the same. So if you think of these in terms of, let's say, a lick, the first is the C scale lick. When you play the C scale, you play all the notes in the box before you move. So you play C and D in the same hole, E and F in the same hole, G and A in the same hole, B and C in the same hole. Don't move. Go up to D, up to E, up to F, G, A. You play B and C in the same hole. You're already on the C, so now you play the B in the same hole, the A, the G, down to F, low E, down to D. Now you play C in this hole, all the notes in the box before you move. But down to B, down to A, down to G, down to F, blow to E, draw D, and blow C in the same hole. So basically the rule is you play the closest C. Now why is this? You do this because if you were to move up from B to C on your way up, when you come to the end of the scale, you're going to have A, B, and you're going to move up to the next C, and then when you have to come back, you move back to the B, when the B and C are in the same hole. Also, we are starting to realize that this, this keeps you from make, making extraneous jumps, and this particular layout is going to be so important when I talk to you about switching corners, which is not, I don't consider an advanced technique. I teach my students basically once they get a single note in the right, second lesson, third lesson, they get a single note in the left. Okay. So, um, oh, let, let me go back to that. Very important. If you can take a screenshot of this, this is the pattern for this scale, C scale, going up and coming down, and all sharp scales all of your sharp scales so if you had to play a d scale you would start on the note d which is within pole one draw you go blow the e draw the f sharp blow the g draw the a draw the b blow the c sharp in the same hole up to d up to e draw the f sharp in other words it's following the same c scale pattern and so you now with this pattern can play every single sharp scale. And when you change, let's say to a flat scale, then the pattern changes. But for all sharp scales, they all follow the C, the C pattern. That's why, of course, that it's uh, nice to be able to play in flat keys because we end up with more opportunities to play both C and F from it. Um, because those are the repeated notes. So, here's how you practice and learn your scales. You practice one scale a week. And when you practice one scale a week, 
sorry. I'm sorry. Um, this just turned on. Can you see that scale? No, right? Yeah. They, I didn't change anything, but it turned off my chair. Okay. This is the... This is the G scale. So what you would do is you practice one scale a week. So I'm saying if you're practicing a scale a week, if you're working an hour on scales and arpeggios, that means you're going to play the G scale for an entire week. You are not going to play any other scale. By the end of a week, if you do not know the G scale and the arpeggios for the G scale, then you should do something else for a living um, or do something else for a hobby. Because basically you need to learn each scale like it's the back of your hand. The object of it is totally to make the instrument part of your body. So the G scale, we're separating it into two halves. Tetrachords, we're called. We play G up to D. And then we play D up to A. And then you put them together. Now what you're doing there by playing the tetrachords is that you are making it possible to learn the next scale next week with only having to learn four notes. Because the end of the G scale, the D part, becomes the first part of the D scale. And so on. So you'll learn one scale a week in the circle of fifths, practicing nothing but that scale for an entire week. And it's arpeggio for one week. In 12 weeks, you will know all your major scales and all your minor scales, or all your major scales in all 12 keys. In 24 weeks, you can learn all your major scales and all your minor scales if you do not try to practice them all. Because the object of practicing is to compress what you're actually going over and then beat it to death. That's the whole object of it. I mean, learning major scales and minor scales is not a big deal. Just think of them as licks. This is the G major lick. it is and um let me see oh yeah okay so most important you're going to practice one scale a week second most important when you split up this is how you split up your practice time if you're a classical player i don't know about jazz that much i've always taught several really good jazz players um the basic techniques um you're going to practice in four parts. The first part is going to be your scales and arpeggios. Second part is that you should play some kind of etude. If it's a corner switch etude or a biting etude or whatever, you know, whatever the etude is, it repeats the same thing, maybe tonguing etude. Third thing is to play duets. The purpose of playing duets is very hard on online because there's latency, but the purpose of playing duets is to be able to play with other people. It's wonderful to be able to play by yourself, but if you can play by yourself in a closet, that does not mean that you can actually go and play with somebody else. So playing duets is how you get to be able to play in time with another person. And the fourth thing you're gonna practice is um, a piece that you're working on. So in terms of harmonica, it might be a movement of a concerto, it might be Bach, might be, you know, this is for classical. If it's jazz, it's going to be some head, something that you're going to learn to improvise over. So again, I'll go over that. The four parts are 
scales for one quarter of your practice time. Etudes for another quarter. Could be rhythm etudes as far as that goes. Three, three is a duet, four is a piece. That's how you split up your practice time if you want it to be as concise and efficient as possible. Okay, so let's do the, were there questions that I had to answer on this part? Let me get this off. Can somebody give me a thumbs up or something? Is there questions? Where is it? Green thing is closed. Yeah, no. no? No questions. Okay, good. Let's go mm -hmm. on to advanced techniques now. Oh, here it says from Bill. What do you mean by a duet? Generally, a duet is two people, but it could be a trio. <laughs> It means that if you're playing one part, somebody else plays the other part. And what this does is get you to listen while you play. So uh, for me, I mean, I think probably, you know, Telemann or, uh, wrote about 5,000 duets, so you should be able to find Telemann duets you play in classical music. But it is a a way to, um, oh, it's important. If you can't find a harmonica teacher where you are, you can learn this stuff and study with another. I mean, I coached with the first flute of the New York City Ballet after I had gone to Manhattan School of Music for 12 years on all the major works for harmonica and orchestra. And we used to play flute duets, and I would play with him. He says, how about a duet with a recording? Yes, the problem with playing a duet with a recording, though, is that the recording doesn't do anything. Um, it's the same problem that you have with playing with your computer. Um, computers don't play in time. They, you know, if you took something as simple as a shaker, all right? You got a shaker, and it goes, shk, shk, shk. All right, so what's the downbeat? Is it shika or shika? I mean, because it's a computer. It doesn't know how to do with retards and all the other stuff. And the problem is when you play with the recording, because I'm going to play with one later because there isn't an orchestra here, um, is that you don't really learn what playing a duet is. And you can't play online duets because of the latency. That means the delay. So here's the deal with it. You play a duet, um, and when the other person takes time, you are maybe holding a long note, and then you move. So let's say we have a phrase, and your phrase goes, and they go, while you're playing the phrase, da, 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 they're holding a note, and while you're playing, so if I decide to speed one up, and then slow it down, the other person can hear it. So when you play duets, you basically learn how to play with other people. Classical music, that I'll explain, uses time for emotion. When we sing and do stuff, we use time for an emotion. So if I sing a phrase and decide to slow it down at the end, that's a natural thing in classical music. You don't do that in blues or jazz because if you have a good drummer, he's going to keep you blocked in. But that's not, that's not what you do in classical music. You know, you would sing a phrase, da ma da di da da Bombida, and there's too much space before the breath. But that's how we play, because that's one of the emotions that we get. And the amount of time we take and how much we slow down and how much we speed up becomes part of the emotional palette in classical music. Time is used as an emotion. So sounds gone low again like yesterday. What's this? You mean my mic? Is the screen share okay? Yeah. Screen, the screen share is fine, Robert. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. Um, 
So let's go on. We are going to go into something that somebody has wanted to, me to talk to about for a long time, which is corner switching. Okay. When you play a note on the right side of your mouth with the tongue uh, on the instrument, sorry about the ugliness of this, uh, it is possible to swish your tongue toward the note back and forth and you get from D to A. So everybody who has harmonicas and is muted um, can do that. We're going to swish your tongue when you're holding the D and you're going to get an A. And I will put this screen share up, which is the corner switch one. I'm sure what's her name here will take it down. Um, corner switch. There we go. Okay. So. Wonderful. Now, can you guys see the screen share? Screen share has stopped sharing the window. Well, thanks. Uh, I think that Zoom is designed for certified public accountants and not for musicians. All right. So here's the deal. You're going to play D right and you're going to switch to A left. There are only two corner switches. One is to swish your tongue between D and A. So the tongue swishes over and you, the A should open up. If you don't get an A, if you get a B, that means you're not playing in tongue block. It means you're playing in you rolling your tongue. If your tongue is on the instrument, you can swish it back and forth and get D to A. All right, now you can make yourself, what is it, an ambulance or a police? I think it's ambulance. All right. Now in the next line, after you switch, switch corners from D to A, you need to blow the G. And the reason is you're now playing on your left side. So you're not going to have to practice on your left side. When you play your scales, once you learn how to play them on your right, you're going to practice them on your left. Usually that means in the lower register, you will play scales on your left side. So I've got a D minor scale here, which is a pattern. You switch D to A, and then you play... And that makes it possible for you to play all these notes on the left and also to get your mouth to be back to straight. Because once you switch, you don't want to do one kind of, it's just switching the tongue. That's one of the corner switches. All right. Now, if we look down below, if we go D to A, that's one thing. If we go D to F, that's a different position. D to A is what I call a fifth or a fourth. That note pattern, those two notes. D to F is the sixth. Now, to switch D to F is the same corner switch as D to A. Because if you get your mouth deep enough to go D to F and switch your tongue, what happens is your tongue gets so far back, you can't move it quicker. So what you do is you switch D to A, and you turn the harmonica with your left hand just to make it go to the F. So it's a D A switch, but you're going to turn the harmonica, and that makes it possible to play D to F. By the way, in case you wonder, when I move down, I push the harmonica in a, in a circle like you're sitting at a round table this way, not straight across and not in one place. I push it. Left hand moves me down. Right hand moves me up. 
So a little motion on a D to A gives you D to F. Now D to D is a completely different corner switch. <clears throat> on D to D, what you're going to do is you're going to let your tongue stick on the harmonica. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you move the harmonica straight across and the tongue rides on it. So what's happening is the opening on this side closes up as you push the tongue riding on the harmonica over. I don't know if I can do it. It's kind of like eh, is when you push the tongue, one side opens up and when you when it rides on the harmonica. I know what. Um, have you ever been in a bathroom where they have the mirror? that slides and it leaves a little slot on one side. And then when you slide it, it leaves a little slot on the other side. Well, that's what's happening. The tongue rides on the harmonica eh, straight across. And as fast as you can move it back and forth is you get the tongue switch. So there's two switches. One is D to A. And the D to F is just the D to A switch with a, a turn. And D to D is where the tongue rides. Those are the corner switches. Now, you need after, as I said, to learn how to play on the left side afterwards. So you play your scales. Where you are switching in the middle. This is where that whole thing of the double C's and the four hole, four hole starts to be important. Because in real advanced harmonica, you divide the harmonica into these DA, AD, DA, three hole patterns. In other words, your left side will be on C and D on one side, and G and A will be, and B flat will be on the other side. So if my left side is on the third hole, the G, A, B flat, I can play right C, D, E flat without any motion. All right. Now, why do we use corner switch? Well, one thing, of course, is if you got to jump. When you're playing large leaps, it's possible to do it, but it's also to make legato between holes that are further apart. You can make legato and you can make legato on chords. Because it's possible to go over the two C's. So the two C's become a real help for us in this case because the right side can be on the higher hole, 5 C, D, E flat, and the left side can be on the, on the B flat. That's why playing in flat keys is good. Now, somebody's going to ask, why do I use draw notes? on this. Why are we talking about draw notes? Why is it D to A and D to F? And D, why isn't it C? Because there are no doubled draw notes. So you, when are switching, you're trying to get to the right hole, and you won't know if you're switching to the closest C or the furthest C, because they'll both sound the same. So draw notes eliminate that. That's why we do it. And it is possible, unbelievable as it may sound, to have, you know, some kind of etude. Let's see if I can find one. Let me play this for you. Let's bring it in. This is an, a, a corner switch etude.
So you can hear that you're actually getting notes that are apart switching. It, what it allows you to do corner switching too is to hold the single note or to use the note on the bottom if it's mo moving and then when you have a repeated note, let's say you, you're playing, that you can emphasize the note, the motion. Because what we're not having to do is get off of that note and get back. It's kind of like jumping on, if you can only jump on one foot, it's hard to emphasize the bottom note or whatever note is moving when you have to make a leap. So this makes it possible to get a, and of course, then when you have corner switches that go back and forth, if you watch how much motion, you don't see anything. And if you did that without the switch, you would, it, it would be hard. Right? Your teeth might get knocked around a bit. Okay. So do people understand when you learn how to corner switch, you're going to learn a D to A switch, then you're going to learn the D to F switch, the same as D to A, and you're going to learn the D to D switch. Um, and then you start to get positions on the harmonica where the left side is in one place and you're playing a whole bunch of stuff and every time you have to come back to it it's there so you play there are also advanced corner switches which is if i'm going to play dg 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 up the harmonica i got to use that to play ah so if you have to play the D would be on the left. So what I'm doing is boom ba boom ba 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 like you would on a piano. Boom ba thumb pinky thumb pinky thumb pinky. As opposed to jumping with one side. And I use corner switches all the time. In the, the Cherubman Concerto, I'm switching over. What's happening is that the left side is moving up, and then I keep the switch going. It's like it goes small, so I'm in, in, and it makes the whole thing one draw um, without having to dip back. All right. And... All those things have corner switches. I'm just switching over everything. It starts it off on the left, it goes back and forth. So you're using corner switch. Eventually, it becomes second nature. You're not really even thinking about it. And all right, so questions about corner switch. Because this is a complicated one and it'll take some time if you're doing it. Um, okay, so now, I'm, oh, by the way, you don't have to just play one note in corner switch. Uh, it is possible to play um, uh, It's possible to play more than one note. It's possible to play two notes out of one side in the Villa Lobos. And in the cadenza that you'll hear me play today, I'm using that. Uh, two note thing all over the place. So it's possible to play more than one note on, you can play two notes on one side, one note on the other. Um, 
But All we've right. got a we've got a question. What harmonica do you play? This is a, a Honer 2016 CDH. Honer discontinued them because Kwong came out with his own harmonicas and made Honer mad. So then they still make the plates. And I have the bodies. I have four, uh, four or five bodies. Um, and I just replaced the plates. I maybe have, you know, 250 sets of plates that well, most of them broken reeds. I break reeds a lot um, because I play, I don't play soft. A lot of times I'll play concerto with orchestra with no amplification, which means you got to blow the hell out of damn thing. And that's okay because you get a specific sound. It's not an amplified sound. And when you get it, you get this huge dynamic range between very loud and very soft, which you don't get when you play with the mic. Because um, mics don't like loud noise. They, they, if you go to record something, I'm always playing down. I'm not playing out. Because it starts to sound really intense, you know, when you play with a mic that close. Um, that said, when you play the chromatic harmonic and you play classical music, the difference between really great harmonica players or really great classical musicians, or the violinist or anything, is the sound. It's that they have power, they have focus. It's all about the sound. Because um, a violin is playing without amplification and there's 40 other violins and cello and, you know, and violas in the orchestra. So how do they come out and because they have a focus, goes to the back of the hall, they play with power. So my um, whole focus is playing with it. But another question about staccato and biting. How do you play your staccato? All right, we're going to get into biting right now. I'll do the biting part. All right. So articulation on a harmonica um, is something that hasn't been discussed very much. And articulation is so important because the whole basis of phrasing is articulation. So if you're talking about articulating notes, um, I use, one of the things I use is a bite, okay? What a bite does is it gives you a beginning boom. And the pickup is immediate. If you use a glottal stop for the harmonica, what you get is it doesn't start all of it. When you add a bite to it, you get power. And the old harmonica players would use so when they the orchestra would come in, ba 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 ba, and they would go. You'd hear this, just nothing, you know. Um, and you say, I mean, there's no power there. And the bite adds a beginning to a note because it brings an immediate thud attack to the instrument. So what is a bite? The bite is where you take your upper lip and you come down on the harmonica. And when you blow, it's the same as draw. This begins in articulation, the sound that you get um, a force. Now the bite also changes the way that you play the harmonica, which is it reduces it from a blow and draw instrument to an attack and sustain. If I play, uh, if you are playing a scale, if you listen to it, there's no support. 
but you don't know that there's no support. I'm forcing the air out. I'm I'm just stacking. The support would come from the diaphragm. But with the bite, you can, if you, if you hit it harder, it's louder. And if you hit it softer, but there's still no support. So if I'm playing, if you listen to each note, there's no support on it, but you don't know that. Most harmonica players, you ask them to play C scale, they blow all their air out and blow and suck it all in, and that's, that's you know. What I'm doing is actually not blowing, I'm just wham, and the cough determines that glottal stop determines how loud something is going to be. So if you attack it harder, you get more volume, but there's no support for it. So it makes it possible to play loud phrases without supporting them with a bite. Um, and it changes the instrument into an instrument that really is going to come out. Where it has volume and power as opposed to an instrument that's kind of cute and you play soft and, you know. So the bite adds an articulation. It's an articulation that Chamber Wong taught me. Um, bassoonists use it. <laughs> it's very difficult for UK players to play with the bite because you cannot have a stiff upper lip if you're going to, you know. Now, it gives you an articulation. What do I mean by that? Well, the harmonica has a problem. It, if you play a chromatic scale on a harmonica, it sounds like bia bia ba bia bia da 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 da. If you don't do any separation, you're getting articulation that's going, you know, da di do da di do da di da da. You know, it's all over the place. Get seasick listening to this. What the bite can do is make it so the accent is on the right syllable, as opposed to the accent on the wrong syllable. And then music becomes intelligent. So you are playing the music with the harmonica. You're not playing the, the harmonica playing the music. You are actually using the harmonica to be an instrument of interpretation. So if I play something as simple as, um, all right, now let's look at that. If you just play the harmonica, what you get is, because A and B slur, because there's no change of breath. So you're playing D, dum di da di dum bum. Well, dum di da dum di da is not a classical music phrase. Good, good if you're going to play calypso, bum, fiata, bum, fiata, but it's not classical music. So what the bite does is it makes it possible to either bite all of them or you can start to fake legato. And when I say fake legatos, you start a bite on the G and let off into the A. Then B to C with the button so you get Sorry. All right, so what is happening is I'm faking the legato. If you watch me just play a scale. All right, so that's sounding bum by um. You're getting a bite, you're getting a slur. Dum, dee, um. But there's blows and draws involved. You don't hear the difference because what I do to it is articulate or tack the, let's say, the draw note and let off into the blow. So now the bite produces phrases. The only time you get into trouble, and then you could just may have to bite everything, is when you have a phrase which is legato 
but then it's repeated by a phrase which goes back and forth between blue and draw. Where, in other words, if you had to play, you're kind of in no man's land. So when you play chromatic scales, I use it to make all the notes even. And that's acceptable in the classical music world. Now that chromatic scale, yeah, is an acceptable one. But if I play it without, then the articulation's all over the place and you get seasick and it's not clear. So bite is the beginning of a specific type of articulation. The other articulations you can do, if you play jazz and toots and stuff, they all play them whistle. That gives your tongue free to, to say ta 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 ta. I also bite out of both sides of my mouth. I mean, tongue out of both sides of my mouth, which is, and this took me about a year to perfect. But if you tongue, tongue in the center, when you get up higher, the notes bend, especially if you double tongue because the k bends the note. The k is a way of, of bending by making the airflow go the wrong way. So taka 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 works, um, but not for classical music. So what I've learned how to do is the tongue out of both sides of my mouth. With the tongue on the instrument, uh, the corner comes up, and you tongue here. You can even do them together. In octaves, you, you, now the two sides of the harmonic tongue, it's like spinning a little piece of tobacco off the side of your mouth. I know how ugly this looks when you're looking at somebody's tongue. Um, so it's possible to learn how to tongue, and I use it all the time. Double tonguing and triple tonguing are pretty hard. But in, in, um, in tongue position, it is possible to tongue and the pitch stays, which for classical music is the most important thing. The difference between a really good string quartet and a really lousy string quartet is they all play in tune. A really good violinist never has a cheesy moment. Um, and your object of playing sometimes is to not have a cheesy moment. Um, I like to think of it as when I play concerto, whatever, it's like the top of a lake that is completely still. And your object is to keep the intensity of people listening to you that you don't disturb that lake. No pebble goes into it to make ripples. Because if you can keep them there, they, they're in your living room. From Gordon? What was that? I saw. Okay. So we've done. Oh, I'll go over that then. Talking about intensity, focus. Learning to play the harmonica with focus has to do with getting on top of your sound. Getting your sound so it's full. What you're doing is basically pushing the reed until just before it walks. And you're using the focus of the sound to go out to the back of the hall. It's the difference between shouting and um, singing, you know, like opera singing. So let's talk about the important thing is that you use the differences in the sound to produce um, emotion. So we're going to talk about intensity. That's what we're messing with, okay? Loud is more intense than soft. Um, muted is less intense. Open, 
Open is more intense. Bright is more intense than dark. Um, a, attack. A hard attack is more intense than a soft attack. So intensity is that. Um, vibrato. I use a vibrato on my left hand. This harmonica, because it has louvers uh, to keep the air from escaping, can, you can use just one finger. But if you watch, my left hand finger comes up for vibrato. I can use that vibrato sometimes in the very low register. I will use throat vibrato. You cannot use throat vibrato in classical music beyond about a G. Because in order to get it on an A, the pitch starts to go down. So these are one of the, the things that, you know, um, I used to tease Adler, but I call them Adlerisms. He, he and I were friends, and I would go and meet him at his apartment in London when I flew through for a concerto. He'd meet me in New York. We'd have dinner. Because we were the only two that were just playing, you know, with orchestra. Yeah. All right, so we got we got vibrato. Vibrato is more intense than non-vibrato. The wider the vibrato, the more intense. So your cowboy vibrato is more intense than... Um, and the speed of the vibrato, the faster it is, the more intense. Now, you, what you're doing is all these intensities and non-intensities, or whatever you want to call it when you don't, are used to make music. The object of all of this technique, every single bit of it, is to not think about technique. Playing classically is not about speed and all the... What it's about is manipulating the emotions of your listener. And what it means is you cannot be thinking, well, here comes the hard part. It has to be where the technique is so part of your body that it just, the music flows out of you. That you don't think about how it, all you're thinking about is making the music. Um, so what's my job? My job is to play the harmonica concertos, the ones that were written for the harmonica. Because in classical music, um, the musicians in the orchestra are, are extremely jaded. I mean, they're hoity-toity, you know. You have only music that's written for your instrument. The only exceptions to that would be something like Bach. It is possible to play Bach. But everything else, you can forget about it Because they don't want to hear it if it's for their instrument, unless you can really make it sound like it's for your instrument. So the major works for harmonic and orchestra, Villa Lobos written for John Sebastian, Chapman written for John Sebastian, the Mio Suite written for Larry Adler. By the way, that's one of my, I won the first Mio scholarship to study at Aspen with Aaron Copeland. So that was a, and he wrote a suite for harmonic. It couldn't be any nicer than that. Um, the Benjamin Concerto written for Adler. Um, the Vaughn Williams Romance written for Adler. Um, the Cowell Concerto, which I did the world premiere of, was written for John Sebastian. I premiered it with Brooklyn Philharmonic and Lucas Foss, and then we did it with the Los Angeles Philharmonic at the Hollywood Bowl. Milwaukee Symphony played it a lot of places. Uh, the Arnold, Malcolm Arnold Concerto, written for Adler and the Gordon Jacob 
there's a divertimento for harmonic and string quartet and five pieces. The divertimento for harmonic and string quartet was written for Adler, and the five pieces I think was written for Tom Durrell. I think I, I couldn't be sure. About that. The other concerti that people play are generally not ones that a, a conductor would ask for because they're not major composers. I'm sorry, it's as I said, you know. <laughs> It's bad enough when you go out to, you know, when you meet the concert master and he says, geez, when I found out I had to play with a harmonica player, you know, in the concerto, they're all thinking, I should be playing the Mendelssohn violin concerto with this orchestra. How can they hiring a harmonica player? And you have to convince them that you play on the same level as they do. So that's basically it. Um, Robert, we have about uh, 20 minutes left. I'm um, going to play. Yeah. Uh, lovely. That would be fantastic. Uh, is that going to be good? All yes. Right. So people can hear me. Let me just make sure that I get, you know, uh, I got to make sure. First of all, you guys are going to wonder what the hell I'm doing, but I got to make sure the damn harmonica is played. <laughs> But there's no sound coming through, you know, if you, if you can hear me. Pete, you're going to have to wave again. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, Robert, I think I can hear your background music sound now.
right. So did, did that, did, did what, sir? All right. Robert, let me just tell you, that was world-class playing at the highest order. Absolutely well, amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. No. Absolute, absolutely mesmerizing. No. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, I hope that some of the diatonic players and play the chromatic recognize just how powerful it is to be able to place something in the let's say middle of your blues set that is not blues if you were to play will you still love me tomorrow in the middle of the forget it the audience would be just going nuts when you come back to the blues it'd be that fresh the chromatic adds a voice that's you know and i can't think of any other instrument that is this emotional it's the one you play the closest to your brain. Uh, so all you harmonica players, thank you for listening. I love you. I love you all.